Hi, this is Molly Cheshire. This is Meetings with Remarkable People. And my guest is Jerry Jacobs, who's running for mayor of New Orleans. And his uh, platform has an interesting plank in it in that he wants to decriminalize marijuana. And he's not a smoker himself, but he sees the kind of difficulty it's caused in society to put a lot of people away for uh, such a small offense, so to speak. So welcome to the show, Jerry. And uh, let me see if I can get your photo up here. Now, what caused you to, uh, to take such an unusual uh, stand? Well, the program that I have, I think, will help eliminate many of the ills in uh, a city like New Orleans today. We have a tremendous crime burden. And everything in the rebuilding of New Orleans after the horrors of Katrina uh, literally boils down to money. As uh, many people say, money is not the best thing, money is the only thing. I had a little less than an hour meeting today with the head of the Injured and Defenders um, Association helping the New Orleans who cannot afford attorneys in criminal cases. And what's fascinating is that uh, the man told me that, the director told me that there are numerous, numerous people who are actually in... Uh, parish prison, and some have even gone to the big house up in Angola, which is reputed to be one of the worst prisons in the United States. It's, uh, it's the state prison for Louisiana, which is pretty brutal is the best way to put it, the accurate way to put it. And our laws today here, I cannot comment on other states, but many states are similar, are quite antiquated as far as I'm concerned. From the uh, little bit of uh, investigating and studying I've done on my own, I think that alcohol uh, usage and cigarette smoking and uh, some other vices, if I must say, if I may say, are more addictive than marijuana. Marijuana, to me, is not addictive. I don't smoke it. I don't drink alcohol. And, uh, people say, why advocate such a position? My response is, my uncle Manny, for years, was a traveling salesman in Texas, Louisiana, and he sold brassiers and girdles, but he didn't use one either. <laughs> well, I mean, to me, whether it's addictive or not is 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 not really the issue. It's it's uh, to me, if if people even even okay, let's say it's not addictive, but let's say that people were addicted, it's not a criminal issue. To me, it's a medical issue, and so I think that it's unfortunate that it has entered the criminal sort of arena, so to speak. And so, I mean, what's been kind of the response with people? Uh, you know, I have yet to, I have yet to find a person against it. That's including uh, a couple of criminal court judges who are friends of the judge. We had parishes and not counties. A judge in a neighboring parish, uh, some top-ranking police officers, officers I know from the health club. I had uh, I can go on and on and on with uh, physicians. I had a routine checkup two weeks ago. My physician said it would be wonderful to do that. Uh, I was in a coffee shop the other night talking to someone I know very casually. He has glaucoma, and he was beating down the table asking me to get it done. I can go on and on and on. I think the laws are antiquated, number one. Number two, I think I can tell you in New Orleans, in Orleans Parish, Louisiana, the uh, criminal court system is so blocked down it's unbelievable. Our laws actually state that a person, if arrested with one joint, can be put on probation and then if later he is caught in the company of a felon with uh, a revolver, the uh, probation can be revoked and he can go to the state prison for up to 10 years, which is incredible that that has actually happened in rare cases. I could go on and on and on, but uh, quite frankly, there's more of a danger drinking alcohol than there is of smoking a joint. And if the joint was uh, either decriminalized or legalized in New Orleans, I'm talking about medical marijuana. I'm talking about personal use. I'm certainly not talking about one who has 100 pounds and is trafficking. And remember, I'm saying marijuana, not opium, not cocaine, not heroin, not anything else, whatever it is. But going back to marijuana, the criminal court system will lose perhaps 50% or more of people who are blocking the court system. And the police will be uh, given the discretion of sending someone with personal use marijuana to municipal court, the equivalent of traffic court, where a misdemeanor citation can be 
paid by a fine as opposed to going into the uh, true criminal justice system. And if this is done, the police will be free perhaps 50% or more of their work where they can go after the big fish, so to say, as opposed to the minnows. The court system will uh, will be freed up from the clogging. People will come to New Orleans. New Orleans will be the Amsterdam of the Americas. The hotels will be completely booked. New hotels will be built. The restaurants for overflow, the unemployed will have access to jobs, whether it's menial jobs as uh, domestics in the hotel or servers or whatever, dishwashers or whatever. There will be jobs available, and as this economic uh, rotation continues to go up the mountain as opposed to down the mountain, the service industries will need more workers, they'll have expansion of business, et cetera, et cetera. And if anyone has been to New Orleans and knows the uh, status of our streets in the city, we have potholes, and this will even give money to fix the potholes. <laughs> well, Belief will change. We'll have high, highly employed people coming to New Orleans for the fun, the beautiful city that it is, the fun that we have, the music. We'll have technology coming in. It just never stops. On top of that, in two, three, at most four years, we're going to have a major rebuilding of the Charity Hospital, the major hospital in New Orleans that was destroyed by Katrina, and it's going to be a multi-billion dollar project, and that allegedly from the governor, and I don't believe the amount, but he says it will create 19,000 jobs in New Orleans. I personally think perhaps half of that, but it doesn't matter. When you start with the marijuana and you start rolling the city into a progressive and uh, upscale development, and then you add the huge economic boom of the rebuilding of the hospital, New Orleans will be the envy of the Americas. Simple as that. I, I agree with you. I'm just going to stop the camera for a second because um, the computer, okay. just a second, the computer. So that's fascinating because, I mean, what I don't understand is why do people seem to be, um, hang on, you know what, it shifted just a second. Okay, one of the, I think the major question that I have for you is I don't understand why they've been sort of ridiculing the whole idea that, um, you know, that that marijuana needs to be decriminalized. You know, it, it seems when I read a lot of the uh, articles about your candidacy that they didn't really take the platform seriously. I mean, what do you, what do you think that's attributed to? Well, uh, I'm advocating social change and not on a uh, slow movement. I'm advocating an immediate social change which uh, catches many people off guard and many people are reluctant to advocate social change or even to uh, agree to social change. The status quo, the psych... Well, aren't you a PhD psychologist? That uh, I learned some years ago in my uh, training in life insurance selling that an individual can reach a plateau of uh, a pleasure level and he's happy with that or she's happy with that and doesn't want to go forward anymore because, in a sense, the boat will be rocked. And that's what's going on. New Orleans is always uh, years behind the rest of the nation. New Orleans and Louisiana are not considered a very progressive and rapid moving state. Some years ago, uh, when the airline pilots would fly into the airport here, they would say, uh, please fashion your seatbelt, we're about to... Uh, land at New Orleans International Airport and please set your clocks and your watches back a hundred years. <laughs> that, that wasn't, uh, that, that was not a joke. And then in addition to that, 50, 60, uh, 50, 60 years ago when I was a kid, uh, when I was a kid and then a student, uh, New Orleans was considered one of the friendliest places to visit. We'd lost that when integration came in and there was tremendous rapid change here because the city's population at one time was perhaps 20 to 25 percent white and 75 to 80 percent black. Well, because of Brown versus Topeka Board of Education in 1954, within two years that was suddenly reversed. And right. then you had the 75 to 80 percent who had been picked on, if I can use that word, who had been picked on for whatever, 150 years suddenly they came to power. And the people with experience in New Orleans were suddenly out of office, out of power, etc. And we had tremendous problems in the city. 
if I remember correctly, 1956, 56 private schools opened up overnight in the suburbs. Wow. That's an amazing. And remember, we're talking about a city that in 1955 had approximately 250,000 people in the urban area. We literally didn't grow from that. Before Katrina, the height of the population was 475,000. After Katrina, I was living here, and it was down to 15,000 or so. Can you imagine that? 15,000 people in the city. Well, Katrina, uh, before the Katrina destroyed New Orleans, we had, I think the number was 180,000 houses in New Orleans. And after Katrina, 102,000 were left standing, and most of those had some serious damage. Right. And then uh, last year, the population went up to perhaps... 300,000, now it's estimated to 325,000. So the fact that 1955, when 56 private schools opened, it showed that the majority of the population was still revolting against Brown versus Topeka Board of Education. The city's schools went down, uh, the more educated children, the brighter children, including the uh, African-American children, went to private schools. So when you put all of that together and see the resulting social problems that we've had with inner-city drugs and robberies and et cetera, et cetera, the cities have serious, serious problems. We're trying to come back from them. And now I think we have proper leadership. I think the city has grown substantially, matured substantially. But the major factor, as in virtually every social problem, one of the major facts and factors is we can't afford it. And if we can't afford it, the other candidates from there are saying, we're going to do this, we're going to do that. We're going to find the money. We're going to raise the money. We're going to squeeze the budget. Well, it can't be squeezed. It can't be found. And according to uh, a columnist in a new newspaper that's starting in New Orleans shortly, he's having an article on me and saying, I'm the only one who's giving any answers. Right. Whether or not you agree, or not you agree with my platform, and I certainly let anyone and everyone disagree with me, but not one other candidate has said anything substantial. As to, instead of saying we're going to raise the money, we're going to find the money, tell me how you're going to raise it and how you're going to find it. Only one who's giving answer, you may not like it. You may be politically opposed to it, morally opposed, socially or whatever, or religiously opposed to it. It doesn't matter to me. Show me another way to do it. It's as simple as that. I mean, I agree. Go, Go ahead. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Well, I mean, I, I, I guess for me, you know, uh, New Orleans has always been kind of a, a freewheeling, you know, kind of a little looser than as far as uh, vices. So I would have thought... Right. May I explain why? May I interrupt you and explain? Give well, no, but, but wait, wait. So I would have thought they would have been much more supportive of this and not ridiculed you as much. Well, you know, they're not ridiculing me anymore. The first <laughs> debate that I was attending, everyone was laughing at me. And then suddenly it sunk into them. I mean, when I gave my opening statement on the NBC station here, debate, the forum with all 11 candidates there, as soon as I said marijuana, some people stood up and started cheering me. And other people started laughing. And by the middle of the first debate, no longer were people laughing. They were listening to me seriously because I said, hey. And then the second debate I was taken seriously. And the most amazing thing is about the fifth debate, I was no longer invited to participate. I actually have a letter in my files that says uh, the only way you can come here is if you show us that you have raised $100,000 in campaign funds. I've done this all on my own. $2,500 was my limit. Well, wait, 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 wait. But that, that doesn't sound right. I mean, I, I, I can't believe that they would exclude you just for that particular reason. Well, I could actually... Fax or email you a copy of the letter. You can post it if you want. But that was the reason. I was, and I called a couple of other debates. I had been left off of the invitation list, and I was told, no, you can't come. Okay. If you don't want me at your party, I don't want to go. But, uh, Is that legal? I spoke to my attorney, and he said it was. And then uh, three of the other so-called minor candidates contacted me. And said they were doing a lawsuit on it. I said, have a good time. I'm not going to waste my time on a lawsuit. I made my point. Going back to the whole attitude and the psychology of New Orleans. Now, New Orleans has been here since 1700 and whatever. But let's just say uh, 
125 years ago, uh, the attitude was, live, drink, and be happy, because tomorrow we may die. <laughs> I'm just saying, you know, we could let, but then we didn't have air conditions in Pennsylvania. We had mosquitoes. Right. But it was true here. And then uh, on just a tangent, the old Code Noir, the French code, which the Spanish kept when it went back and forth from Spain and France. Right. Code Noir said that the only person who can, the only white person who can be in the Louisiana Territory is a descendant of Roman Catholic. Uh, European Roman Catholic descent. No one else who's white is allowed in the territory. Now imagine this, you're the governor of Louisiana and one of your lieutenants runs up and says, Governor, Governor, we've got a problem. He says, what's the problem? He said, we've got a bunch of Jewish merchants opening up a store down the bayou. And he's thinking, okay, we're worried about malaria, we're worried about the English attacking us, we're worried about the Choctaw Indians coming in, et cetera, et cetera. And you want me to worry about two Jewish tailors? You know, it was just, don't worry about the rules, let's live and enjoy ourselves. And that went on for years and years. And uh, so if you ask about why would marijuana not be accepted, it is accepted, but the fact that I was challenging the laws, I was challenging the status quo, people were mocking me originally, and now they're not. Whenever I walk down the street, I wear a black Homburg. And, uh, I've, got a, I've got a photo of it on, on the screen. Oh, okay, okay, well, I bet in, in the summer I wear a straw Homburg, and I always wear a hat. It's my moniker. And, right. Uh, my, my comment is, everywhere I go, I have people saying hello to me, and, oh, you're the guy who's running for mayor and wants marijuana. I said, that's correct. And uh, last uh, Friday, or Thursday or Friday, I forget which, it doesn't matter, I went to a local sandwich shop, uh, restaurant, sandwiches, that's uh, very, very, very popular. And when I was in there, I saw a friend of mine who's a police captain, fire chief, a number of police lieutenants, a number of firemen, et cetera, et cetera. And they were all talking to me, saying they were going to vote for me. That what one says is not necessarily what one does. Well, at least they're giving you lip service. That's correct. That's correct. And that's why I say, as far as I'm concerned, the great majority of the population agrees with what I'm saying. I had one childhood friend say, why don't you get serious and run for something and I'll vote for you. Doctor said, you know, you don't have a chance. I said, I know. And he said, but I like your message because I'm going to vote for so-and-so. It's okay. And then another doctor told me he would write me a check for $1,000 if I was serious about this. Well, the people want it. That's all I'm saying. And whether it's enacted this year or next year or five years from now, I don't know, but I'm trying to put this on the table so people can consider it. Two weeks ago, New Jersey was the 14th state in the United States to uh, put some type of uh, loosening up, if I may say that, on marijuana, especially medical marijuana. Uh, well, I mean, this so, this to me is the tragedy, is, is that from what I understand, there's so many different uses for medical marijuana and not smoking it. I mean, smoking it actually is the least effective way. And and the doctors, a lot of the doctors don't even realize this. And so to oh, go ahead, I'm sorry. To keep medicine away from people, you know, that I mean, supposedly it can cure cancer. Yes, I've heard that and one step further is uh I have to think it's probably been twenty five, maybe even thirty years since I smoked marijuana. I used to, you know, it was a Crazy young man is the best way to put it, like uh, so many people who will not admit what they did 30 years ago. Oh, I mean, all, all the major candidates, you know, Obama, everybody says that they've done, smoked it, but then, you know, when you say, well, let's legalize it, then nobody wants to talk about it. They're afraid of getting voted out of office next Sunday morning in church. I've had rabbis tell me they agree with me, my personal friend who lives in another state, but I constantly call him for religious and moral discussions. Uh, he got his PhD in psychology wherever he's, I guess he's about 58 years old now. And uh, he's an ordained rabbi. He said, well, of course. He said, I thought, I realized this when I was studying psychology. I had a former, a retired Roman Catholic priest who works out on the self-help, the same health club I do here in New Orleans. And he said, it's the most ridiculous thing in the world that you have to fight this. It should be done. I have not had any conversations with any Protestant ministers 
especially fundamentals, fundamentalist ministers, but I assure you they are against this, which is their right. Morally, politically, they're entitled to their own opinion, but uh, I disagree with it. And regarding smoking marijuana, if I were to start using again today, uh, I would not smoke it. I would put it in a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. And the reason that I say that is the crunchy taste uh, of the peanut butter, crunchy peanut butter, of course, and the taste of the peanut butter is strong enough to hide the uh, bitter taste of the marijuana, the cannabis, or whatever. And by doing that, I would have no effect on my lungs and or heart because everything would be washed out in a normal bodily fashion. And I wouldn't be hurting my lungs by smoking. Uh, but well, they they say that it's 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 not that the, you're hurting your lungs that's the issue, but that it's uh, you're combusting a lot of the cannabinoids that are uh, that are much more healthy if you concentrate it into an oil. That's that's what my understanding is. Well, that, that's I haven't looked into it for years, but that's fine. I mean, uh, all I'm saying is it can be ingested in whatever fashion. It can be uh, used, ingested, or whatever. And uh, you can have the effects of the high, if you're doing it for pleasure purposes, or you can have the medicinal effects. You can treat your glaucoma. Uh, you certainly, as a doctor, know much more about this than I do. I'm not, oh no, I, I, I'm, I'm not a doctor. I'm just a layperson that's been, you know, introduced to this because... Okay. My friend Paula Gloria has really done a lot of work on this, uh, and and it just seems ludicrous to me that that if it does have medicinal qualities, why you know okay I'm not a doctor but there have been scientific studies nobody's well no one will even look at the evidence. That's correct. Uh, I can tell you the conspiracy theory, but I don't think it's necessary for this interview. But. Uh, it would certainly uh, destroy quite a few uh, locked-up businesses, if I might say that. It would certainly hurt the alcohol trade. Well, uh, you know, supposedly um, they were saying that, you know, like uh, in Mendocino County, it's it's basically legal. And, and even where it's very available and very legal, alcohol is still the drug of choice with underage drinkers particularly, you know, because... Usually they say it's easier to get pot than it is alcohol, but, uh, you know, for kids it seems that that's not really the case, even though the pot's really available. Well, I was told, and I have no statistics on this, I was, we both know that there are quite a few uh, accidents and serious injuries, if not deaths, from alcohol consumption and driving. I was... Uh, very friendly many years ago, perhaps uh, 30, 35 years ago, helping a woman here who uh, founded the Mothers Against Drunk Drivers, MADD chapter here. And the reason she got involved is her son was, uh, I won't say exactly what happened, but he died traumatically because the woman of the other vehicle, the woman driving the other vehicle was uh, drunk. And I have yet to hear of one accident where it was uh, driving under the influence of marijuana, because it is my understanding and my belief that marijuana slows you down. It sedates you, so you're not going to be driving 100 miles an hour on the highway and run into someone, whereas alcohol speeds you up. Well, I, I wouldn't really advocate either, but what I'm saying is, is that regardless, uh, I think that there are other industries that are going to be threatened by if they legalize it, but I also think that there's a, it, it'll create an incredible new industry, you know, and as you say, it's going to bring in new jobs. I mean, just talk about the prison system, because on your website you had some um, sort oh, of statistics. System, uh, here are some actual uh, cases that, that occurred. Obviously, uh, most people, including yourself, can think back to Katrina and see that the city shut down for a while. Agreed? I mean, there was no authority in New Orleans for a while. Oh, definitely. A poor individual was caught with a couple of joints. And for whatever reason, the police sent him to OPP, Arlene's Parish Prison. And he went to the lockup cell and holding cell, and for whatever reason, he wasn't bailed out or couldn't get a bond or whatever. But he was there for a very small amount of marijuana. Katrina hit. 
took him one year to get out of prison because everything was uh, in disarray. There were no computer systems. Nothing could be done. And literally all that happened is the prisoners were chained and taken as soon as they could be evacuated from New Orleans. They were taken away. Literally for uh, 24 hours, the prisoners wearing a chain like one sees in the movies, the prisoners were on top of an overpass chained to the uh, concrete and had to ride out the hurricane that way. There was no evacuation. There was nothing else to do. The prisons were flooded. Now, this poor guy, because of the uh, unfortunate situation, was in prison for a year before he was released. But most importantly, the system, if it had been running properly, would have put him into Arlene's Parish Prison before the uh, required paperwork or administrative system or whatever could be processed that he could get out. Point number one. Point number two, the prisons in New Orleans are so loaded with uh, so many petty crimes because of the laws, especially marijuana laws, that right now it is actually a felony. And people, if the officer wants to do it, the, the officer will either release the person and not charge arresting officer, will either release the person and not charge him, or the officer has to write him up as a felony. And he goes to prison. And there are just hundreds and hundreds of people who are in prison because of this, because of the antiquated laws. Point number one. Point number two, from an economic standpoint, depending on which study one reads concerning here in New Orleans, I'm just going to take the middle and say it's $1,800 a month to keep a person in prison. Oh, I think it's more than that. Well, you don't, you don't know the Arlene's Parish prisons. Oh, maybe not. Anyway, we've got a minute left to, uh, to, to kind of wrap it up. So is there anything that we haven't talked about? I mean, I know we're going to do a show with Jane tomorrow, but um, anything that you wanted to say to wrap it up? Well, uh, not really. I mean, I could talk for hours about this, but uh, I just think it's a ludicrous, uh, antiquated crime that is on the books, and I think the social change is moving forwards to start freeing these. But as I said before, New Orleans is a uh, very slow city. This is going to take a lot of time. I put the acorn, but we have to let it grow to an oak, oak tree. Well, all i got to say is, is that, you know, we don't have a candidate here in New York City running on the same ticket, so I think you're way ahead of the game. Appreciate it. I appreciate it. So, uh, okay, well, thank you very much for inviting me on your show. Well, so nice to have you here. That's Jerry Jacobs. He's running for mayor in New Orleans, and we all wish him luck. Thanks a lot. Very much. Thank you. Bye-bye.